So with that in mind, I'm delighted that Brian Sanders is able to join us virtually from his uh, office in Austin, Texas, where it is uh, Tuesday evening. Hello there, Brian. Thanks for being a myth buster and thank you for sharing your story and your food journey with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Brian is not a rancher, nor was he connected in any way with the food chain except as a consumer until relatively recently. Brian, take it away. Hi, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here virtually. I'm here in Texas, got a lot of great ranches around me, got a lot of great beef, just had some for dinner, actually, it being 9 p.m. over here. And I'm here to talk about, yes, my experience and my, my journey, my studies, and I have the presentation called The World's Biggest Scam. I think blaming beef for some of the world's biggest problems is, to me at least, and maybe many of the people in this room, the world's biggest scam. It's, it's crazy, and by the end of this presentation, I think everyone will agree. So who am I? Yes, I got a little intro there. Um, I am a filmmaker. I'm making the Food Lies film, which will go into great depth, debunking all the myths uh, put forth by the plant-based films and the plant-based movement. I've been working on it for three and a half years. Uh, I've been studying nutrition for seven years, and I had my own, yeah, I had my own health journey. My, I actually lost both my parents to chronic disease, and I got serious about my health about seven years ago and have dedicated my life to it ever since. And just about two years ago, I, I've just found so much value in red meat and beef that I started a company. So that's when I finally got into, you know, giving people access to beef. Uh, I also made a little YouTube film debunking the Game Changers film, which many of you have heard of with all the plant-based athletes, so I debunked that. It was actually the same length as their film. So here are some of the world's biggest problems. It's not all of them, but I think they're some of the biggest ones, right? There's human health decline. We have heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. I mean, these are the big three in all Western countries and moving to other countries as well. We have malnutrition, if we're talking about the entire world. I actually just visited Africa for the film to uh, see some of the native living peoples, look at the difference in diet and their health and how uh, it's changed and how it couldn't be very good or it could be very bad depending on how that's changed. Uh, another big problem, healthcare costs. Uh, I have some, I'll, I'll get into more of that later. Environment, right, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of people are talking about global warming, about methane emissions, about the soil destruction and unsustainable water use. So this is very important to our future of feeding us. And then there's the ethical, the ethical aspect. I mean, there's a lot of vegan people with, you know, very good points about you know, not harming animals or treating them poorly. And uh, luckily, I know a lot of great ranchers uh, around the world that do very much care for their animals. So we'll get into that. So again, here is the great scam. So somehow cattle has been blamed for all of these problems I've listed. So many big problems in the world, and somehow we're blaming this poor cow. You know, it, it's just, it's gonna be crazy. I, I, I'm gonna try not to get mad, but once you start understanding this information, when you go beyond the headlines, you should get mad, because it makes no sense. It's, it's insane. So part of the problem, and why we need to know why beef is not bad for us and the environment, is we need to know the real enemy, right? If we, we can't be fighting the wrong enemy, how, what, that, what good is that going to do, right? We need to know the true enemy. This is not, you know, the, the exact Sun Tzu quote, but we do need to know our enemy so that we can fight it. And I will have, I'll, I'll be throwing a lot of information out there, so I put it all on nosetail.org slash beef, and uh, all the studies will be there. So we'll start with beef and human health. So I believe red meat is a superfood. So this flies in the face of everything that the mainstream media is telling me. And we're gonna jump in here. So it's a great new study by uh, a friend of mine in Israel, Vicky Bendor, that just came out very recently, within the last month. And he looked about 25 lines of evidence from about 400 scientific papers and found that for about two million years, humans were basically carnivorous and we relied on fatty meat. He wrote a paper a few years ago called Man the Fat Hunter and we we're always building technologies and part of 
you know, our whole life was a, a, acquiring meat. And yes, of course, we had plant foods for many other reasons, and it's fine. But uh, this great paper showing how much we relied on meat. Uh, this is a great one with the, looking at the stable isotope data. So this is the nitrogen isotope we can see uh, through the remains. And this is the upper Pleistocene modern human diet. There's also some Neanderthals, which is in a cave up in, in France, I think, modern day France. And we were at the top of the food chain. They found with this hard evidence that we were, based on the, you know, the stable isotope, nitrogen isotopes in our bones, that we were highly carnivorous. So these are some of the animals we were eating. They had a lot of megafauna back then. And there's even some bigger animals um, before they were wiped out um, many hundred thousand years ago. So moving on to our bodies, I, I, I'm just going to lay the foundation of why meat is so important, if that's not obvious. So I'm, I'm starting way back at the beginning. So our bodies change. A lot of vegans will try to compare us to our ancestors, you know, these primates, chimpanzees. Well, that was seven million years ago, and a lot's changed since then. And so it, it doesn't matter that we don't have fangs. We haven't need, needed fangs in about three and a half million years when we started creating our own tools. And my great friend, Dr. Bill Schindler, studies all this, great paleoanthropologist, and he would knock two rocks together and create a blade. And this is when we did not need fangs or claws because we started processing food outside our body and acquiring food with tools. And that's what makes humans so amazing. So, as we started getting more nutrient-dense foods, our small intestines grew. We, it grew longer while our colon, our, our large intestine, got smaller. And the small intestine is where we digest these highly nutrient-dense, bioavailable food, animal foods, beef, ruminant meat. And the colon is where you would digest plant food and it would ferment. So you can see all the primate relatives have the large colon, the large intestine, and we have a small one. So a lot of research has been done to show that as our brains grew, we did this at the expense of our guts, and this was because we had access to great nutrient-dense food like animal foods. And we also have other evidence that our stomach acid changed. I mean, it's very metabolically taxing to have a high pH stomach, right? A very acidic stomach. And we have one of the most acidic stomachs. So this is no accident. So a lot of scientists agree this is from our millions of years of scavenging meat. We would show up to the carcass and it would be rotting and you know, other predators already got there. And we would come in with our, you know, maybe throwing rocks at them and sticks and trying to chase them away and, and get the leftover meat. And so our stomach acid was able to digest that. So we're, it's, we're, our stomach acid is similar to a hyena, which is a scavenger, and vultures, which are scavengers. So, most people know meat was crucial in development as humans, yet today we're somehow told it's bad. So it's funny because some of the stuff, I mean, this is just basic science, but people have this cognitive dissonance where they're like, yeah, yeah, we ate meat forever, but now we don't need it so much, right? So, well, let's look at some more modern hunter-gatherers. So we have, uh, this is from the Ethnographic Atlas. They studied, uh, I don't remember how many, 100-something uh, native living groups, and 73% of them got over 50% of their diet from animal foods. And of course, there are no plant-based societies. That's a zero in the bottom left. Now, here we have another study on stunting. So this is about malnutrition. And there's a lot going on in this graph, but on the right, we have the developed states. There's Australia second and the United States first in the highest amount of, well, lack of stunting, lack of this malnutrition of, you know, preventing children from growing. And in, in the most, we have Sudan, India, Bangladesh, Ethiopia. So these are the places where they eat the least meat. So I drew in that red line, that trend line, but you can see all the black dots are the risk of stunting. So you can see there's a clear trend that as you eat less meat, you have more stunting. So here's another great study talking about this that they've identified six micronutrients that were particularly low in these vegetarian diets in certain countries, Egypt, Kenya, Mexico, vitamin A, B12, riboflavin, calcium, iron, zinc, and very, very drastic uh, health consequences, anemia, poor growth, rickets, impaired cognitive performance, blindness, neuromuscular deficits, and eventually death. And animal source foods are particularly rich sources of all six of these. So that should tell you something. Uh, here's a fun one. Hong Kong diet is 46% meat, dairy, and eggs. It's it's uh, one of the highest in the world, if not the highest. 
And they also have the longest life expectancy in the world. And it's been increasing in the last 46 years as they've been eating more meat. So again, just a correlation, but it's a fun one. Um, here's another one in Asia. The risk of mortality for total meat intake and, and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat, poultry, and seafood. So that means the more of those animal foods they ate, the less likely they were to die or the longer they lived. Now, it's important to note that all protein is not created equal. When uh, you do nitrogen analysis, uh, the plant food nitrogen is not actually usable protein to our body. So you have to take into account the digestibility. And when you do these equations, beans, which are supposedly a good source of protein, are actually about one third as bioavailable and usable protein when, it, when it's all said and done. So this is important to know because people are saying, hey, you know, we have all these great plant foods now. We can eat rice and beans, and you know, those amino acids are all we need. Well, that's not true. So you'd have to eat a, a lot more of them. And then guess what? You're going to eat a lot more calories. And most people in the Western world don't need a lot more calories. So here's a quick one on just comparing some of these most popular plant foods against food like sardines. I could use liver, beef liver, and it would have been off the charts, and it would have destroyed all these plant foods. But I said, hey, let's use sardines. Um, just all these great fat-soluble vitamins, way more than any of these foods. This surprised me. I thought, oh, man, carrots, peas, you know, fruit. It's like, that's so healthy. Oh, my gosh, it's so healthy. And then you look at it, and, and when you, this is just USDA data. This is just plain data. Anyone can look up. It's not there. The, the, the actual nutrients aren't there. So moving on to cancer, people say meat causes cancer. Well, I had the good fortune of interviewing Dr. David Clerfeld. I got special permission to interview him. He was on the WHO working group that decided meat caused cancer in 2015. This is the famous thing everyone quotes. Well, I'd have one, one of the only interviews with him. And he told me, you can listen to it, the Human Podcast, said they were a bunch of vegans and vegetarians with an agenda that he brought studies to the table, and they did not look at them. They threw them out, ignored them. He was showing good evidence that meat does not cause cancer, and they threw them out. And so th this is what they did. They were working with 744 studies. They actually only used 29 and 27 to do their final you know, conclusion, and it was almost a wash. If you look at it, 15 red meat is good, 14 red meat is mad is bad, you know, it wasn't that far off. And so w when we look at this, the meat and cancer, the risk factor is only 0.18%. So that's very small. And just to put that in perspective, when we, you know, we found out that cigarettes had a, a strong link to cancer, that risk factor was about 10 to 30%. So now we know that something's there. And we did a lot more research, and we, we found that that was true. So just know that this meat and cancer, this small, small 0.18%, that 0.18% could be noise, right? That's not even enough to be significantly, uh, statistically significant. And so it's, you know, there's all these other things that happen when people who eat more red meat tend to eat more fast food and exercise less and smoke more and all this type of thing. So it's, I, I know a lot of great doctors that would say that that is the, it's a healthy user bias that's the problem, not the red meat. It's what other things people are doing who eat red meat. And we have some great data uh, showing people eating high-fat diets that include a lot of meat going against the guidelines are reversing type 2 diabetes. There, 94% of patients eliminated the redu or reduced insulin usage in this study. You can see a whole bunch of weight loss as a result. Their A1C went down, got off a lot of meds. This is stuff that you'll never see in the mainstream media. Here's another study showing the, the diet with the more fat, the more meat, and less carbs. All the health markers improved, except for LDL, which we can talk about. But you can see the weight went down. This is the, these pink bars. Weight, the greatest weight loss, greatest H1, HB1AC, A1C, the, the lowest glucose. Everything's good. Very low triglycerides. You see a great improvement in the triglycerides. And then that one that goes up, HDL, that's a good thing if your HDL goes up. It's the only thing is, oh, LDL went up a little bit, but a lot of people would disagree with uh, the fact that that means that much. Uh, here's another one. Dr. Zoe Harcomb put together some data showing that the death rate per 100,000 people in Europe went down as they ate more saturated fat. 
So this is exactly opposite. This, this big scam started with blaming saturated fat and cholesterol for heart disease, which we go through in depth in the film, so we can't get into all that now. But I'd like to start pointing the direction at the real problem. This is the real problem. This should be obvious to people, yet somehow it isn't. It's the processed food. So we have the foods we've been eating for all of history, these, these animal foods, and then we have the foods that we just brought in. If you look at the you know, timeline, 3.5 million years since we started making tools and eating meat, these sugar flour oil, these processed ingredients, have only been around for 0.01% of that time. So it's pretty strange that we're blaming all the diseases on the foods that we've been eating forever. So even fortification, this is a funny one. We took away red meat from the diet. We're saying eat less red meat, eat less full fat dairy. And all of a sudden, these scientists realized we were lacking in nutrients. Of course, we just took away our best nutrition, but our stupid food pyramid is backwards, so now they're like, oh, well, maybe we should just start supplementing and putting these fortifications, these vitamins in. But guess what? Maybe that, that doesn't always work the same. You can't just take, for example, iron filings. They just take basically iron and put it into bread. Maybe that's gonna have a bad outcome. And now we're actually just starting to figure this out. There's many studies, there's many people talking about this now. This is very new. I'm just barely getting into this on the extreme correlations between this fortified iron, this, this non-heme iron that's not meant for our bodies. Heme iron is found in red meat, and that's good iron. And we're putting in this different type of iron, so much so that cereals are magnetic. So this, this is another interesting one to look at. So healthcare costs. So now that we've seen that red meat's not the problem, we need to figure out what, how, how do we solve this healthcare crisis? Because 90% of the nation's, well, this is for the US, $3.8 trillion in annual health care expenditures are for people with chronic and mental health conditions, right? So we're lumping in mental conditions, but these are preventable things, uh, the chronic conditions, right? These 90% of these things can be fixed or reversed or ameliorated or, you know, got, get, we can get better in some way with a better diet. And I think we have the wrong idea of what a good diet is. And this is gonna be huge. So in the next 20 years, we're talking about $47 trillion. This is something we need to talk about. So we need to look at the reality and know that beef can help solve these problems. It's not the cause of the problems, it's the solution. And if I had more time, I could have gone into way more on how it can help with heart disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes. I work with a doctor. We, we do this every day. We reverse type 2 diabetes. We help all these markers get better for all the cancer and heart disease. And it's, it's the real culprits are these modern processed foods. And it's these new seed oils. It's these refined grains. It's processed carbohydrates. And it's too much sugar. And maybe even the fortification. So, we need to know the real enemy, not red meat. Now, we can get into beef and the environment. So, two-thirds of land cannot be farmed. So a lot of people don't know this one. They just say, hey, why, why are we you know, putting cattle on the land? Why can't we just grow some corn and soy and wheat and feed it to people? Well, much of the land, two-thirds of it, is not arable. You cannot do crops on it. It's hilly, there's rocks, it's not conducive. And what is it perfect for? Growing grass and ruminants. Lamb, bison, buffalo, all that kind of stuff. This is what this land is made for. So another one no one's heard of in the mainstream is that 88.4% of a feedlot cow's lifetime diet is inedible to humans. So we're even talking about feedlots, right? You know, that there's, you know, there's all kinds of good ways to raise beef and finish it and finish it on grass. Sometimes we have to finish it in a feedlot, but hey, that's, that's not so bad, that's very efficient actually. The feedlots, if they're done well, and animals are treated well, they, they actually provide a great service. They're getting a lot of these leftover, you know, maybe it's, it's distiller's mash, it's these grains left over from distilling beer. We have from corn, uh, from ethanol, and we can feed that to them. So they do a great service. They're using grass, something inedible to humans, indigestible, we can't derive nutrition from, 
And with their specific, amazing digestive systems, their rumen, they can turn that into highly bioavailable protein. So they are not really competing with us for food. Um, this is a really amazing one. I had to get really deep into a study to find that the, the average, on average, livestock double the amount of high quality usable protein that they consume. Meaning, over the course of their life, they're eating this low quality waste food or grass that has almost no protein and is not usable to humans, and then we eat there, we eat them. And that is a great service. And so, yes, it does take resources and time to do that. But we get great protein and great nutrition from that, and it's a very valuable service they provide. So getting into soil, I mean, we've known about this for a long time. Uh, and uh, some of these the myths that, that Brian's trees, talking about. Are we counting this into their equation? He's are we coming back. Getting mad at trees for taking all the rainwater? No. Well, guess what happens He's when back. you get rid of that rainwater? Beef is and milk are the best of these four. Uh, I pick almonds and Lovely. lentils. Well, almonds do take a lot of water, and lentils are known for you know a good source of protein. But um, yeah, look at beef. Look at milk. When you take away the rainwater, and look what we get. So this is some new stuff that, that no one's talking about. I mean, there, there's a cost to produce all foods, right? And so we have to think about these things. We have to think protein is more important than calories. And we get quality nutrition from beef and milk, not just calories, and there's a cost to that. So here's just saying that 94% of the, it is rainwater, uh, that it's put into those calculations. So here's another one, Sacred Cow is a great film, Diana Rogers, Rob Wolf, shout out to them, great people, showing that the real problem is the industry, transportation, electricity, industry, all these things are the vast majority of the greenhouse gases. So the livestock is only 3.9%, and of that, beef is only 2%. So this is, again, from the US, but this is very you know, telling and, and applicable to the world. So we just need to stop listening to this old, outdated information that you know some film, some vegan film from from six years ago used that was already retracted. That data was retracted. Now the herd size is actually going down. So this is in the U.S. This is from the USDA, and this is from the world data, and it's basically staying the same. So this is a good point that the the herd size is not growing. It's not like we have just exponentially growing animals. It, it's staying the same. And that's very important for the next slide when we're starting to talk about CO2 and methane. So CO, CO2 and methane are these greenhouse gases. They're very different. So CO2, these are these, this is from the fossil fuels So on the right. So this is a one-way street. So we're, we're seeing this CO2 going it's buried deep in the soil, deep in the ground, and this is the fossil fuels, and we're burning them and getting them up into the atmosphere. This is a one-way street. This is not, this is adding to, greatly adding to the, the toll on the environment. Yet, the methane produced from cows, this is a closed loop system. They, they're eating grass, they are fertilizing the soil with their feces and urine, they are, put, you know, everything is a closed loop system. The water, the methane, it goes up in the atmosphere and it comes back down and helps the grass grow and it goes on forever and this is what's always happened. And there's been giant animals grazing for all of history. And here's another one showing about the fact that methane is a flow gas. It actually only stays in the atmosphere for about 10 years. So because our herd as a world is staying constant, there actually is not building up more methane, right? Because it only lasts 10 years and it's this constant circular flow, while CO2 lasts for about 1,000 years. And you can see that as we continue to, you know, all these other forms of CO2 emissions from industry and transportation, everything else that no one's talking about, they're just trying to pin it on cows, uh, that's, that's what's building up and causing the problems. So here's a... and I rearranged it. So I put the plant foods on one side and animal foods on the other side. 
And it turns out people don't waste animal foods. They're expensive, they, they're more expensive relatively to plants, and they're valuable, and people eat them and don't waste them. And, plant, and food waste is a huge problem. This is actually one of the big contributors, if you look at anyone's data, not just you know, our side's data, that food wastage is a huge problem, and if we can figure out a way to mitigate it, we can do a lot. And so I'm saying, hey, well, plant foods seem to be the problem here, not animal foods. Uh, I like this because people say that going vegan is going to do some great good and it's going to do so much. Well, they did a study in 2017, and if 10%, which I don't think anywhere near 10% of the U.S. would ever go vegan, it would only <laughs> reduce the greenhouse gases by 0.26%. So that is not going to do anything. What we need to focus on is everything else. So here's the reality. Beef can help solve these problems. Again, it's the opposite of what you've been told. Environmental destruction, global warming, methane emissions, global warming. If we have more regenerative agriculture, we can put more carbon in the soil. We can, we can focus on other things for methane. Cows are not the problem, but you know what? There's actually great stuff going on with seaweed and other things they're feeding cows that can help uh, them not produce as much methane. There's soil destruction. Well, monocropping a whole bunch of corn, wheat, and soy, and whatever else, that causes the destruction of soil, uh, using animals to put back their nutrients into the soil will help that, and then the water thing. Of course, all food takes some sort of toll on the environment, takes some water, and beef gives us great nutrition, so we can't blame it on, can't blame the water usage on beef, there's always something there. And the real culprits, again, fossil fuels, fracking, uh, there's great satellite data showing that uh, where we thought we were, we thought we were um, having a lot of methane from cows, it was actually fracking. And so I think in the next couple of years, we're gonna get some really compelling evidence showing that it, with this new satellite technology, showing that it's actually fracking, that, and then again, we blamed cows. The transportation, the monocropping, and uh, something I didn't really talk about is the factory farming of chickens and pigs. Now, I don't want to disparage these great you know, animals and food sources, but I mean, they're really not raised as well as beef. All beef, you know, they spend most of their life on grass. Another thing I, I forgot to mention in the slides, and even if they do go to a feedlot at the end, it's still, they still spend two thirds of their life on average on grass. But these pig, chickens and pigs, they're uh, it's kept in these giant barns, these giant warehouses with a million at a time. They actually com they do compete more with us for food because they're monogastric animals. They require higher quality food, um, a bit more protein, and, and so they are fed more grains and all these crops because they have different digestive systems than cows. So, hey, just something to think about. It's, it's not, let's stop blaming beef, all right? Okay, so. Beef and ethics. This is a touchy one, this is a hard one. So I'm gonna let uh, my good friend Tara Couture take it away on this one. On our farm, we have some pigs that do their piggy thing in the forest. We have ducks that live on a pond and we have meat rabbits and turkeys and chickens and we have both meat and dairy cattle that are all just solely grass fed, including the dairy cattle. And we raise our animals from when they're born until when they die. You know, this idea that we can unplug from death, that we can not be a part of this horrible machine of death by opting out, by not eating animals. To me, I believe that's a, a stunted thought. We get to the point of discomfort because something had to die for us to live. And so we stop there and decide, well, therefore, I'm going to back up and not eat whatever had to die for me to get there. Well, everything has death around it. Anything that's alive had to die for you to eat. We can say that the natural world has always had it figured out and that we can be in that system and we can mimic systems so that we can have food like with ruminants moving through and stuff like that. Or we can say, I don't like death, so I'm not going to eat things that had to die and so I'm just going to eat foods that are not from an animal. Unfortunately, 
to do that, you have to destroy entire ecosystems to grow your food. And I cannot tell you about the amount of life that's around us right now. There's all sorts of birds, there's toads, there's snakes, there's bears back there, there's coyotes back there. And that's just the stuff on the surface. Like we're not even talking about what's going on in the soil and everything else that's around us. So in order for me to grow the food that will not kill anything, I'll have to kill all this. I'm gonna to have to strip the soil. I'm gonna to have to level everything out. I'm gonna to have to steal water out of vast aquifers so that we can irrigate the shit out of this place because it's not gonna have any water retention possibility anymore. I am gonna take all the fertility out of the soil because to level this, I've gotta do that. I will end up with a moonscape. It's death in a plate, there's just no blood. It's the same thing times a million. It's much worse. It's not one animal that who lives a good life, who moves through within a biodiverse system, who contributes to that system. The way that whoever created all this figured out long before us, much smarter than us, and that is, is contributing and is part of it, just like we should be part of it. We should be part of this too. We're here, we're gone, and while we're here, we need to be living as, as close as we possibly can to how we're supposed to be living and that includes our diets. All right, that is something uh, I wish I could have said. She said it so much better. I, she's a big part of the Food Lies film. She's amazing. This line makes me tear up every time she says it. It's death on a plate, there's just no blood. We have to realize that for something to live, something must die. There's no free lunches in nature. This is the reality. And I, I think we're disconnected from that. And people who, th these anti-meat activists are the most disconnected. They're the ones in the coffee shops in, in Santa Monica, uh, where I used to live. And, and they're the ones that have not been to a farm. They don't understand how the ecosystem works, how the circle of life works. And these are the people that are the small minority that are trying to change things and they're making the biggest noise. And so I'll get into some more data here through studies. A study out of Australia, 55 sentient animal lives lost to produce 100 kilograms of usable plant protein. That's 25 times more killings than to produce the same amount of rangeland beef. That is just the nail in the coffin right there. The ethical argument is very hard um, when you're talking to these very impassioned people and you know they have, they have their values and, and it's great and I commend them for their values but they need to understand that it's not what they think that there's many ways that animals die growing plant foods. That over half of the mice taken by predators after harvest. 80% decrease in the population so that means once you take away, you harvest the wheat, for example, that was their food source. Now there are thousands and thou tens of thousands of mice that die. They starve to death because they don't have their food source anymore. And I know a great Australian rancher, actually, who, who talks about this, makes videos about this, shows, shows what happens when these, these animals die and how you have to protect the fields. We have, they have to shoot animals. There's so much pest control, growing crops, deaths in combines, and deaths by starvation. So we have to start thinking, what's the alternative? We can't just say, oh, well, we'll just not have animal foods anymore, and we'll just grow crops, and everything will be hunky-dory. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. When another point is here, what, what, do you, what do you think happens to these animals in nature? They get eaten alive, or they starve to death? So. So yes, what's the alternative? How do we replace this high quality animal protein? Are we gonna make it in a lab? Does that not take a toll? Does that not use greenhouse gases, all this refrigeration, all these chemicals, all these antibacterial agents and energy going in to produce this? Do you think that's free? That's not, they never think about this. How are we gonna re replace this high quality miracle protein that evolution and nature and whatever it is created all this, as, as Dara said, Whoever created all this, there is some amazing stuff going on, and I think we can outsmart nature in some great ways. We can get an airplane and we can fly somewhere, 
but some things we can't outsmart nature in. I'm sorry. Uh, here's another thing to think about. On a worldwide scale, livestock farming helps the poorest billion people the most. No one's talking about this. There are so many people in developing countries that rely on animals. I saw it firsthand. This is their number one priority, their number one part of their life that gets them through the day is their animals, their milk, their meat, their eggs. Th this is not part of the, the discussion. Another, not, not another thing that's not part of the discussion is how many other products are made from cattle? This is just beef here. There's all animals. We use the whole animal. That's, the, that's what we do. We have hundreds of products that are made from the bones, from the intestines, from everything. Every type of industry you can imagine, we're using at parts of beef. So what are we going to do? Make these synthetically? We're going to make these out of plastics and more fossil fuels. Do people not understand? Do these anti-meat activists not understand that it all has a cost? It all has a toll? Oh, OK. The real culprits here. We have to start looking at the reality of our enemy. It's modern foods. So when we're talking about health, we have these new seed oils that I could do a whole presentation about, and I do have great people in the film doing it. How, how may, maybe these are the most deadly things we have, these new seed oils, these fats we weren't supposed to eat, that we just started eating, these refined grains you just process down and spiking our insulin and blood sugar. Too much sugar, just always eating it, maybe even the fortification. These modern lifestyle factors, people sitting around, you know, everyone knows this. We sit in offices all day, smoking and alcohol, lack of sleep, not getting outside, not getting your vitamin D in the sun, not being in nature. These are the culprits. This is why our health is declining. It's not because of beef. I could have made so many more slides about how beef consumption is actually going down. You know, we had these guidelines that went from the U.S. over around the world, and people did eat less red meat. And what happened? We got less healthy. So we need to start talking about the real enemy, the real culprits, modern industry on the environmental side. It's all the things I already said, fossil fuels, fracking, transportation, monocropping. These are the things. Stop using beef as a scapegoat. It's insane. It's insane. It, we're living in an upside down world. Sometimes I seriously get like kind of overwhelmed. I'm just, I can't believe that this is what it's come to, that people actually believe this that this mainstream news narrative is still being pushed, that we're still having big billionaires buying up land, investing in fake meat companies, thinking they're going to save the world by somehow outsmarting nature. It's not going to work. I'm telling you, we already see that it's not working. We see rampant disease and just an insane increase in chronic disease and obesity and all this stuff. So in conclusion, Beef can solve these problems. It can solve the human health side by eat, getting quality nutrition, avoiding the processed foods. We can s solve the environmental side, getting away from you know, really bad, say, maybe chicken and, and pig farming with some bad practices. We can s get away from, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers to the, the fossil fuel stuff or, some people say that's not even, you know, global warming's not even from. It's, it's not, I have no, I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm talking about cows, I'm talking about cattle, steers, beef. These are not the problem. And then unnecessary term animals, again, this is a question that we can debate for the rest of time. And it'll never be solved because it's part of nature and everyone has their opinion and for something to live, something must die, and I don't know how else to, to say it. So basically, if people want to avoid meat, it's on them. Uh, I, I, there's a mountain of evidence showing that it's not doing what you think. It's not going to help save the world if you don't eat meat. It's, you're going to have nutrient deficiencies. You're going to have probably more problems than you have currently. So if, if you want to avoid beef, that's on you. Uh, there's nothing I can do to talk you out of it other than to show you the data that uh, cow, cows, cattle, beef are the biggest scapegoat, the biggest scam. Just blaming it on this miracle, miraculous animal is just a travesty.
And here we are. Uh, uh, this is a group here in Texas. These are people just embracing red meat. A lot of these people only eat red meat and well, losing half their body weight. I, I know all these, not I don't know them all, but I know a lot of them have lost a ton of weight and just feel amazing. They're embracing beef every meal and um, they're changing their health. So you can go to all the references that I mentioned, uh, nosetail.org slash beef. We're getting them all up right now. All the studies, show your friends, show your family. And thank you so much. And, uh, Thanks yeah, so much, Braun. Um, Braun has uh, uh, very kindly agreed to uh, take some questions from us. And while we move around, so have a bit of a think, put your hand up and we will get a microphone to you. Brian, it occurred to me as you were speaking that it's probably not for want of trying that peak bodies like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in your country and its equivalent here, Meat and Livestock Australia, it's not as if they've been sitting on their hands on this. Why do you suppose their messaging is not cutting through nearly effectively to, to, to counter some of these things? And why do you suppose a film is a better way to go and will be more effective? Yes, it, it's a question that I have myself. So why is it not getting through? You know, I started realizing this for myself once I started trying to get in the beef industry and trying to sell beef. And I realized there's no profit in beef, very small profit margin, right? And then I noticed processed food, huge profit margins. So it all starts there. If you're raising good animals, you're putting all the time and money into making a great product, and then you're getting a few bucks for it, how are you going to get um, the profits to do all the marketing, the lobbying, all of this? So process, the profit is in the processing. So when you have a cheap product, you have, especially even if it's subsidized, like in the US, corn, wheat, and soy, well, then you can market up 10x, make 10x a profit, then you have money to do all the commercials on TV, advertisements on the internet, you have lobbyists in your government, and you perpetuate this. And I, I think it's all, it's right there. It's this inherent problem to nature and to the, the fact that beef, especially, is, is not, it's not easy to raise and there's just no profit in it. I mean, there, of course there's some profit, but it's just not enough to combat the, the huge juggernaut, which is the other forces in the food industry. And oh, and a film, uh, I think we're living in a culture where everyone's consuming media, right? Everyone's on their phone, it's social media, it's film. It's, vegan films change people's minds and I've run into people all the time, especially because I talk about it nonstop. I'm talking about this stuff and they always, oh yeah, I saw. You know, cowspiracy, you know, didn't work for me. I tried it. <laughs> yeah, these, th these films are what uh, this day and age needs. What stage along what can be a very long and frustrating uh, road to produce a documentary film, what stage is Food Lies at as we speak today? Yeah, it is a long journey. We're three and a half years in. Uh, we filmed our last uh, tour in, on the east coast of the U.S. a couple weeks ago and in Africa a month ago. So we have all the film in the bag. We've been editing along the way. We have it mostly written out. And so we, we actually started the soundtrack. We've started graphics. So uh, we're trying to get it out by the end of the year. But it is a, a very slow process to make something uh, of, you know, the quality that I want. And you have adopted uh, what is becoming, I guess, more and more, a more and more popular uh, way of financing things these days. You are, you are for, for want of a better term, crowdfunding your movie. Um, the issues that you focus on and have spoken today necessarily uh, directly affect uh, North America. But it's pretty clear, by the way, people were nodding here, that the, the themes that you are talking about clearly are universal ones. So if people on this side of the planet want to get involved and get behind food lies, how do they go about that? How do they get on board and how do they make sure you film your, finish your film and get it out to the people who need to see it? Yeah, thank you for that. We're on any go-go still, but so foodlies.org is the site, and you can click through there, foodlies.org, and it'll go to the Indiegogo. 
and we need every dollar. I mean, this is a project I'm doing on my own. I've done it all on my own dime. I have a great director producer that's not taking any money. We're putting all the money just into graphics, the score, and uh, just post-production. So thank you for that, foodlies.org. Look, anybody who's put even a minor level film together, as I have over um, the, um, uh, the last 40 odd years, will know uh, how um, often difficult it is uh, to, to get traction uh, with things like that. So we salute you for the effort that you have made to date, which is obviously uh, not inconsiderable. And we particularly thank you for, uh, it's not desperately late in Austin, Texas, but you are working back and we appreciate you doing that. We really wish you were here in Rockhampton in Queensland. We think this is a particularly special uh, event. We only do it every three years. And uh, we really appreciate your involvement. We really look forward to seeing the film. And hopefully, in three years' time, you're able to... Uh, uh, the borders will be open, COVID will be a thing of the past, and we can uh, get together face-to-face, -to -face, and you'll be able to talk about the uh, stunning success of your movie. Uh. I would love that. We would talk about maybe the second, the sequel. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Brian Sanders. Well, that's us done for Beef Australia 2021. And what a sensational week we have had right here in the beef capital of Australia. Yeah.